Grace and Peace. This is Pastor Renee Teague, and I'm delighted you've decided to join us on this third Sunday of Advent. I welcome you to this worship service. And please feel free to pause your video whenever you need to. And right now you may want to, to grab your Advent wreath. You know, an Advent wreath doesn't have to be on a circle. In fact, mine in my den is straight on the mantelpiece, and this one behind me is on snowflake things that I have from some time past. Your candles can be blue and purple, one or the other, or both, or they can be any color candle you happen to have. We need five candles for the four, Sunday of Ad four Sundays of Advent, and then the Christ candle is traditionally larger and white. Now you can see that I kind of broke the rules. Mine is gold, really yellow, but I call it gold. And it's in the middle and it's not taller, but it's different. So you feel free to be creative with your own Advent wreaths for you or for you and your family. Um, they can be in a lot of different shapes and sizes and maybe that would be something fun to do right now and then bring it back so that you can light your candles as I light these for our third Sunday of Advent. If you ride by Enon, you'll find that our picnic shelter has been turned into an Advent wreath. Go by and see those candles lighted too, if you have a chance. And now for the reading of the lighting of the Advent wreath. And in that region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Be not afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will come to all the people. And this is from Luke 2, verses 8 through 11. The angel announced the news of a great event for all the people, and the shepherds were amazed that God's own messenger should come to them to tell of the Christ child's birth. But that is the way God acts. We are all his people, young and old, rich and poor, regardless of our race or background. God loves and reaches out to everyone with his good news. On the first Sunday of Advent, we lit the first candle to show the light and hope Jesus brings to the world. On the second Sunday of Advent, the Advent candle reminded us that in Jesus, God came to dwell among us. And today, we light the Advent candle to remind us that Jesus was born for all people everywhere. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy, mild God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Let us think about the people of the world and remind ourselves of all the different kinds of persons for whom Jesus came. Let us think of persons close to us for whom the good news of Jesus is intended. Let us remind ourselves that the love of Jesus is for our own family too and for each member of it. Jesus Christ came for all the world and that is a reason for great joy. Our scripture today is from Zephaniah, chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. Sing aloud, O daughter Zion, shout, O Israel, 
Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exult over you with loud singing, as on a day of festival. I will remove disaster from you so that you will not bear reproach for it. I will deal with all your oppressors at that time, and I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you home at the time when I gather you, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Please join me now in one verse of O Little Town of Bethlehem. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in the dark street shineth the everlasting light, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. You know, what Christian doesn't cherish the vision of eternal light beaming from the ramshackle stable where the Christ child dozes in the arms of his mother? Who doesn't celebrate the hope his birth brings to a world where hope so often seems in short supply? But fears, what is fear to do with Christmas? The history of the carol provides a hint. O Little Town of Bethlehem was written in 1868 by the famed preacher Philip Brooks. The Civil War had ended only three years earlier. Yes, Lee and Grant had signed their peace accord at Appomattox Courthouse and shaken hands on the deal. If you haven't been to Appomattox, I encourage you to go. It's a beautiful vision of um, Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Grant. The battle-weary veterans from both sides had laid down their arms and trudged home. But half the nation still lay in ruins, and the notorious Andrew Johnson, by most accounts the worst president the United States has ever seen, was doing his best to dismantle the rights that had been won for the former slaves at such a horrible human cost. On the home front, north and south, families had been decimated by the carnage of the most brutal war America had ever known. Wives and mothers counted themselves fortunate to receive home their sons and husbands, even though they might be missing arms or limbs or live with nightmares and fear and trauma. Not the same men who went away to war, but they had them home at all alive was a blessing to them. In 1868, it gave Americans some comfort to picture the humble Bethlehem stable where hope and fear meet each other and where hope emerges the ultimate victor. Long after Brooks put pen to paper to describe those silent stars floating over Bethlehem's deep and dreamless sleep, we still long for an abiding peace that is freedom from fear. Yet, we don't vanquish fear by denying or avoiding it. 
which seems to be a thing we try to do, just skip over it and act like it's not there. We need to admit that fear is as much a part of the Christmas story as peace and joy. It actually helps to begin our Advent journey with a frank acknowledgement of our fears. For it is only by moving through fears to the joy that awaits us on the other side that we truly grasp the triumphant good news of the Christ child coming into the world. But we tend to pretend there is no fear. There's more fear in the Christmas story than most of us care to be reminded of. It's unmistakably present in John's fiery preaching, of course, but we glimpse it also in the angel's repeated greeting, do not fear, do not be afraid, do not be afraid. Yes, the angel says not to be afraid, but the fact that such an exhortation is needed tells us that the people in this story are experiencing fear. Fear is an ever-present reality then and now. Our God is a God of love and peace, of empowerment and affirmation, but we don't get to Christmas joy by detouring around fear. We get there, as Philip Brooks knew, only by allowing the hopes and fears of all the years to meet one another in that little town of Bethlehem. Who would advance such a crazy idea that seems so out of step with popular culture? You know, a Christian, that's who. A Christian who believes God's promises and knows them to be true. In this life, there are things to be feared. It may not seem like the thing you want to do, but there are things that we fear, and it's best to acknowledge that. If we did not fear the worst outcomes of human life, illness, poverty, pain, suffering, and all the rest, we'd be considered foolish. So what do people fear? Is it wrong to fear? Is it sinful? On Facebook, it looks like a lot of people think it's just plain sinful. Do people of true faith really experience fear, or do, does faith mean that you have no fear? Well, first of all, there's a difference in worry and fear. There's a difference in anxiety and worry. So worry is repeating and thinking about things that are real causes for concern. And worry just means you kind of sit and turn on them, but they're a real cause for concern. Fear, fear on the other hand, is something that you can make a difference in, but it, it's, it's a more gripping emotion than worry. For my purposes here, we're going to call anxiety an overwhelming physical response when you can't exactly put your finger on what it's about. And anxiety makes the whole body feel impacted. And it's all that a person can deal with is the anxiety. It might impact your breathing patterns or sleeping patterns. If you're having problems with anxiety, you may contact me or you may contact your help provider and, and get some assistance with that. There are people that can help you with anxiety. And in this time and place, there are a lot of people suffering with that mental health issue. If you're struggling with worry, with worry, it's it tends to be based on a lack of control, on, on feeling out of control. You're not able to um, trust God with things. Well, if you're dealing with worry, pray. Pray about the things that you're worried about and then try to turn them over to God. Then if, if the worry is something that you really have control of, like if you're worried about money issues because you're spending more than you're bringing in, then work out a plan to change that behavior. If, it may be that you're worried about things that you can't get done or you, you just can't accomplish enough or whatever. Well, try to set some boundaries. Sometimes people give us things for us to worry about when they really are ours. Okay, you know, as a parent, sometimes we worry about our children's decisions. Well, if they're over 18, it's their decision, and we need to work at letting that go. 
Uh, maybe your worries are because you just can't accept other people as they are. And so you worry about how they're leading their own lives. Well, making some boundaries so that you understand that others get to make decisions and that they may not align with your values, but accepting that person as they are can reduce your worries. Do people of faith experience fear? Of course they do. Of course they do. Fear, but fear is different. Now, fear in, in this season with COVID and these things, it's quite rational. And fear is an, an intrinsic biological response. So with fear, we get an adrenaline rush. And the adrenaline was built to help us fight or flee, to help us fight off the enemy or run really fast to get away from it. And it's how we're wired. It can't be sinful. It's how we're wired. Now, what we do with it is something else. Right now, what we're having is things that we're afraid of get all mixed up with worry, don't they? And a need for control. So since they're all mixed up, we need a mixed response to deal with our fear and worry and our anxiety. Fear isn't a sin. It's okay to talk about it. No matter what the Facebook post said, fear is not a sin. You don't lack faith. Being afraid doesn't mean that you're an unfaithful person. It doesn't mean you're a bad person or a bad Christian. So how do we deal with them? I mean, I've talked about them, but that hasn't really reduced your worry, fear, or anxiety, has it? Okay, so here are some things that you can do. You can pick up a pencil or a pen and a piece of paper and write them down. What are the things that are bringing you fear and worry and anxiety? Write them down. And then split your paper in half. And in the second column, in the second column, write down whether it's your problem or not. Yes, this one is my problem. This one is my problem. This one is not. This one is really not my problem. Okay, and just acknowledge that that one really isn't. So if, just as an example, if I'm worried because my refrigerator is broken, then that's my problem. But if I'm worried because someone else's refrigerator is broken, that's their problem, not mine to worry about. Okay, does that, does that make a little sense? Figure out if it's yours. And then if it is yours, figure out what you can do about it. Figure out something that you can do about it. List the things that you can do and then start doing them. So if I'm worried that my refrigerator isn't working right, that is my problem. So what are some things that I could do about that? Well, I could put a thermometer in it to see if it really isn't working. I could clean it out and clean its filters and stuff and see if that helps. So I can make myself a list of things that I can do, and then I can start taking action. In all honesty, in all honesty in this season, I'm quite afraid of COVID. Um, I don't want to be sick. I really don't want to be sick. I don't want to make someone else sick. I'm afraid of my family being sick and unable to work when they need to work. I'm afraid that one of us will be sick and will be in the hospital alone. I don't want to be there alone and I don't want to be here while one of my loved ones is there. My fear is a normal human fear, but there's no place for my adrenaline to go. There's no fight or flee needed. So now what? Well, now I take the actions that I can. And there are some things that I can do to help me deal with this fear that is just mine to deal with. I start every morning with a little time of meditation and I do a little journey, a little journaling. I'm using the Calm app and they have a question every day and I find that really quite helpful. Um, today it was where do you find peace? Where are you at peace? And I thought of sitting at my kitchen table and looking at the birds at the bird feeder and how much peace that brings to me. So I take a little time each morning before I do anything else and have a time of meditation. I found that an essential oil offers a scent, a smell during that time that then I can bring back to mind and revisit the peace. So you might find that a scent, a smell of a candle or an oil, that something like that might help you. I pray. 
I pray about those things, and every day I hand the troubles over to the Lord, and and I find that I have to do that over and over again. So when that fear comes back to my mind, I say another prayer and try to hand that fear, that concern, that trouble back over to the Lord. It takes work. It takes work. And I want to encourage you to do the work and deal with your own worry, anxiety, and fear. And then accept yourself. Accept yourself as you are. Try to love yourself because God sure does. Even if you're a worry wart, even if you're struggling with anxiety and anxiety attacks, even if you find yourself very afraid, or maybe you find yourself none of these things, and that's a little troubling. It's a little troubling to me. But maybe you're none of those things, and and you, you accept yourself. That's who you are. Step into the manger scene with me. Step into the manger scene where Mary and Joseph are. Can you feel Mary's fear? Can you sense Joseph's worry? They're new parents, brand new parents. They're out there by themselves. They're, there's all the unknown of a new baby, a new baby in an unstable world. Now, just curl up in the manger there with the baby Jesus and be loved. Let the balm of Gilead soothe your soul. Let the love of the Lord your God soothe your heart and soul. O oh, little town of Bethlehem, it's true that the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. In a matter of days, we will gather to celebrate the good news of the Messiah's birth. May we discover anew in these days of expectation that when hope meets fear in Jesus Christ, the fears are put into perspective and the peace of Jesus is what reigns in our hearts, in our minds, and in our lives. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come to you in a time of prayer. We, we are aware that you know all things, that you are involved in our lives, and that you already know the things of our hearts, but it helps us to speak them aloud to you. And you have asked to hear our voices. We lift to you our concerns. We pray for those who are sick. For those who have COVID-19, especially for Joel Gibson, as he's in the hospital and sick. We pray for those who are hungry, for those who have lost their jobs this year and are now struggling just to get by. We pray for those who are expected to lead in this time that you would strengthen and empower them to do their jobs, to lead this great country and this world toward a place of wholeness and healing. We lift before you our joys, for we have much to be joy-filled about. We thank you for the season for those who are getting better, we thank you for a vaccine on the horizon. We thank you for a beautiful weather and joy-filled days for children and laughter. Gracious God, we pray for the world, that the world might know your peace, might accept others as they are, might find your love, and your kingdom might indeed come in all the corners of the world. We thank you for this beautiful season of joy, and we ask that you turn our hearts away from 
the fears of the world and stir them with the hope of your coming. Amen. If you would like to make an offering to Enon, you may do so online at www.enonumc.org. You may also drop your offering check in the back door of Enon Church or mail it to Enon. At this time, please take a moment to complete your offering. And now as we close, let's sing Joy to the World. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. Go forward this week filled with the joy and the love of Christ and bring your worries and fears and anxieties to those loving hands to be calmed and soothed. Amen.